uh, one is significantly better than the other. The GoTo medium will record the whole screen, whereas my camera just records what's on my camera, and then I can just interpose the image later. Okay, so I'm going to use the light, the white, because it comes off easier. So we're both we're practicing both chiaroscuro here and the um, application of texture. Now certainly you can draw every single hair, but modulating the intensity of the hairs is going to help with creating the sense of, of soft fur. And then we're also hampered by the fact that, well, if this was completely a, a completely black animal, we'd have a, a totally different outcome because the white fur has a different property than the black fur. And the photograph appears to be fairly contrasted. So it's almost like it's going to be an artistic interpretation of what we see here. But be that as it may, which is really what you should do, an inter artistic interpretation of what, what you want. Okay. So. His eyes. Proportions are important. Block in the major shapes. Please don't screw this up. <laughs> I always get nervous when I record it. Okay. Now, the features of the face are just as important on an animal as they are on human as far as distance and size goes, but because we don't, we're not hardwired to see the individual likenesses of the animals the same way we are the individual likenesses of the human face, you have a little more leeway in capturing a likeness, people will look at it and they say, oh yeah, that's a wolf. And people might look at your picture of a drawing of a human and say, oh yeah, that's a human, but they may not feel that it's the human that you, the same human that you're using as reference there. Okay. So. And then there are other times when you can look online at pictures of drawings and stuff and spot which ones your instructor has used for her model. <laughs> Is that good or bad? <laughs> well, that means that you're drawing them exactly like the image or close enough that you can identify that image or that model as the image for that drawing. Yeah. It's still so superior to work from life, so much superior, but it's harder with animals, of course, because they, they don't tend to care much for holding still. So in the old days, before they had photography as you know ubiquitous as it is now, they would do a lot of field sketching. There's pictures in, if you look up uh, Walt Disney, the first major, I think it was Bambi, they actually brought in live animals for the, the animators to sketch from to get the feel Lion of Lion King. Lion King too, yeah. But the Bambi was the first one of that genre. And there's pictures, old black and white pictures of, the, of a pen with rabbits and deer and things in there <laughs> and people sitting around drawing them. And as far as I know, all the game companies that I worked for, I started at life drawing. I didn't, we didn't get to do the animals, but if you don't, if you can take, you should get good enough at your drawing that you can take your your sketches that you do from life from people that you are, are modeling for you or that you see in the street or whatever and be able to build a finished piece from it that is convincing and realistic by just taking basically visual notes. But of course, to do that, you have to practice and practice and practice and practice and practice and practice, just like playing a musical instrument. Okay. As you can see, I'm sort of massaging 
this the port the proportions or the shapes a massage is kind of kind of almost like I'm I'd like to say I'm sculpting it Did you find your keys okay. oh, um, anyway there's two ways of looking at an image. One is in, in the 3D form and trying to see the, the roundness of the form and then balancing that off with the, the negative and positive shapes almost as if I'm laying a grid across either my image or if, it's, if I'm looking at a person, I do the same thing. I lay a grid in my mind. It's a picture plane because in front of your eyes in a picture plane, you're going to see, you're going to have you have a flat thing. Wherever your eyes turn, that flat picture plane goes with it, right? So imagine putting, in, um, superimposing, and you can actually make one. You can make a, a thing you look through that has a grid, and that can help a lot because it shows you in an exact optical illusion where something is in relationship to something else in space where your brain might be going, oh, that hand is a lot closer, so it has to, you know what I'm saying? I don't know if I'm making any sense, but anyway, that's what I'm, I'm trying. Slightly rambling, but understandable. Slightly rambling, but that's what makes it interesting, right? Well, this makes me want to do a painting, actually. I love drawing. I think drawing is my first love, but I, I really love painting, too. And I'm missing it something fierce. So I need to be doing more of that. Okay. So we have white areas here. All right. Now. Because it's white, it comes off fairly easy. So I'm going to back off some construction. When doing a more finished piece, you can do this. When you're doing a piece that you're submitting as showing how you are actually structuring your drawing, I want to see this. I don't want you to necessarily erase it. If you're working on a tablet, you can start a new layer on top of your sketch and then just turn the sketch off. So you still have your sketch and then you still have your finished drawing. So that can be helpful. Okay. All right. So the major transitions that I see are where the in this particular case is where the two colors of the fur are crossing. And the angle of your stroke is going to have to reflect the direction of the fur. And all animals have a particular, human beings have this too, a particular direction that the hair happens to go. Sorry, I have no idea what that is. I don't know if you guys can hear it or not. Just a little tinkling in the background. Yeah, there's there's some electronic. It's a microwave. No, it wasn't a microwave. Some electronic device was going off. So it's much more texture here. So I'm just looking for the places where the texture is going to be most uh, most visible. And then it does fade off quite a bit, but it's kind of nice. Now this would be a little different on if I use strictly black paper. Because I'm I've got the mid-tone that I can I can either use or not use. Sometimes when I do paintings, I will um, color or tone the ground with a specific base color that then unifies 
but then you're working with color and that's not what we're doing here we're working with tone and value which you have to conquer tone and value before you can even think about going into color and that's really important you can strip all if you can strip all the color out of an image and the image still holds up structurally and in 3d and compositionally then you successfully composed and constructed your drawing. If you strip out all the color and the, the image flattens out or you lose the uh, you lose the shape and the form of the figure that you're trying to work on or whatever, then you're doing something wrong with your values. And it's important oops, shoot. So sorry. It's important to get your values sorted out before you try even try to do color and in fact if you're painting I'm always going to go back to the referring and painting because it's just another tool you can do the same thing with with digital painting if you want to um, having your values set when I paint from a still life or I paint from a figure that's going to be a serious long-term painting I always do a grisaille which is a black <laughs> all right editing time black and white um, hopefully somebody will help me edit this video before it's posted and then it won't be so bad you can see my setup here paintings in the background la da la is that a hint is that a hint yeah no I'll, I can think I can cut this one chunk out oh the the one that's going on yeah okay All right, so another thing I do, whether I'm looking at a model, right now I'm looking at my screen and comparing back and forth. Could even do go so far as to reduce the size of this image. And there's another technique that people use called right sizing, where it's usually done with casts. You have your picture set up next to, immediately next to your drawing. You have your still life set up immediately next to your drawing, and they um, you can right size it, which means you're going to look at it's going comparing the two directly, left and right. I can't look at the computer while I draw, unfortunately. I have to look at my paper, but I can take. Across I think that's going to be the hardest thing once I get to Wacom is remembering to look at the computer screen, not the Wacom. Well, it's a, it's a Wacom. Yeah, they it's pronounce good. it Wacom, but um, the Cintiq is supposed to change that. But I have really? I, <laughs> yeah, I've tried to use the Cintiq, and I find that the it's I can't see because I turn my pencil sideways like this a lot. With the Cintiq, you got to draw like this. I can't see what I'm drawing when I'm doing that. I need to be able to look around the edge of my and they do have some of the um, some of the programs do account for that kind of uh, variation in the tilt of your pen it's such it's such a pain to set up for me I just you know it's it's just I'd rather just work with real materials because that's just me but not everybody is like that. So if you're doing a, a right sizing, as you can see across, I'm trying checking the proportions across here. And to do that in a um, on a live model, you would be walking back and forth across 20 feet or so of your studio, back and forth checking sizes because when you're up close close to it, you can't see the proportions. Things have to be at least six times away six times the size away from your image and you have to be to get something in proportion you need to be three to six times the total height of your subject away from your subject to get the proportions correct does that make sense yes it's it's a difficult thing. If you're sitting too close to the model, it's just as bad as as uh, photographic. Wait, let me just. I want this to do this fit on screen. Um, it's almost as bad as having um, a fo distorted photograph. 
because you can't get the proportions. You can't see them correctly. Now you can back up, do your proportions from the distance, and then come in close for detail. One thing I like to do when I'm paint, painting or taking uh, reference for painting is I will use, use now see now everybody's using digital. I have a digital camera and an analog camera. It's hard to get analog stuff developed, but I have a really nice camera that has a a zoom lens on it. So I would set up the model and I'd take the photos with the whole picture and then I would use zoom in with the zoom lens and catch like close-up of the face, close-up of the hand, close-up of the feet, so that I have these detail shots that I could work from for extreme detail. You can do that from life, too. by From the same focal point. Yeah, from the same exact focal point without changing my, my stance or my distance. Now, there's going to be some, some slight distortion because you are using mirrors and lenses and not your eyeballs. But um, it's a way of uh, getting the uh, close-up and personal, which is why some of my stuff has super high realism quality. Working for this, there's two. So there's two basic ways of working. One is alla prima. <laughs> One is, uh, which is means painting fresh directly to on the can directly on your um, canvas with direct paint, direct color, that's really takes a lot of practice. And it's a different kind of a look. And it's good to know both ways. Um, the other is to do a more traditional Renaissance style where you build, or um, academic style, where you build up your values first with a grisaille or an underpainting, usually in black and white, sometimes in sepia, on a toned background. So when I do my drawings, when I do my paintings, I work on a toned canvas too. I don't work on a white canvas. I never work on a white canvas. Um, it just, you can't get the, it, it, the middle tone is, and when you're working in the Photoshop too, you should do this. If you want to see the true color of something, you put it on a mid-tone, a neutral tone, because a dark paper will show or a dark surface will show the colors to be lighter than they truly are, and a light paper will show the colors to be darker than they truly are, and th it throws everything off. So you need to be able to work in such a way that you've got, um, you're seeing the true mid-tone value. So I like to tone the canvas sometimes with a sepia, because it's a, like a, or sanguine, like a red, red sienna, burnt sienna, because it's a, the under color can be used to. If you're using photo, if you're using oil paint, you be layering, you're layering up the paint, and you can actually get a translucency to it. Photoshop works a little, of course, works a little differently because you're not actually blending in the same way. I mean, there's, I think there's similarities in the blending ability. If you know how to oil paint already, you can make use of that. But then again, you're using light reflecting versus light emitting. Two different kinds of color uh, theory. You guys are aware of that, right? You have RGB and CMYK yeah. is one example, or RGB and um, red, yellow, blue is the primaries for paint and red, yeah. green, and blue is the primaries for light. So Photoshop works, of course, you're working with the light emitting materials and with paint, you're working with light reflecting materials. So it's, it's a bit of a, it's difficult. Although when you're working with digital stuff, you can experiment more because you're not going to lose your stuff. You can always make an extra copy of it. Okay, here's another one of my pet theories that I like to, I, my professor back in college, I had this theory way back. My professor said that I should write a paper about it and get it published, but I don't know where to write it or where to publish it. But the theory is this, 
is if you work with digital materials long enough, you will become crippled in that you never have to finish it. You never have to make a decision. You never have to say, okay, if I color it this way, that's it. It's permanent. Like when you're doing uh, something with traditional materials. Working with traditional materials, you have to accept when things don't go quite the way you want them to and be able to work with them and still make something come out. Um, be willing to take risks. Oh, if I put this color on the sky and it bleeds badly or bleeds differently than what I'm trying to do, then I have to work with it. You have like to be willing to work with it. Pardon? Sorry? Mommy. <laughs> <laughs> so on the one hand, it's... You're stuck with it. You can't change. Exactly. You, and that makes you more decisive and also more flexible and also more creative because you're working within the limits of your materials and your materials have some say over what you're doing. Um, digitally, you have complete control, but on the other hand, you never have to make a decision and you'd never have to worry about trying something that isn't going to work. So on the one hand, using digital materials allows the, the artist or the student to be able to experiment with techniques that, and ideas that they might not normally be willing to experiment with. So it frees you up in that regard. However, it can be an endless experimentation. There's never a, a resolution. It's never done. It's bad enough when you're working with real materials and it's never done. That happens a lot. I think probably some of you people that work with some of the artists here that work with other traditional materials run into that. It's never really done. I could work on something forever, but then you get to a point where your materials, your paper starts to disintegrate or your paint becomes muddy and you have to let it set or, you know, there's a, there's a bunch of things where it just becomes too much. And now there are some artists that take advantage of that ability to destroy the surface that you're working on. You just can't duplicate that. If you, are anybody familiar with Simon Bisley? It's a pretty well-known illustrator in the sci-fi fantasy realm. He's like... I've heard of him, but I don't know if I've seen his work. I probably have. He's an animal. I mean, if you look at his originals, he's got gouges in it. He, he, he carves things. He's, he uses ballpoint pen, and then he uses paint. and he uses, It's like he uses everything. That's, whatever's at hand in the studio, he, he applies to his... And he gets some really amazing results. Of course, we don't see the stuff that doesn't work <laughs> because he doesn't show it. And that that is um, you know, that can be kind of because you guys, if I'm, when I'm doing these demos, you can see when I screw up and how I have to deal with it. Yeah, working true. working with the traditional materials, and sometimes it's a happy accident. Sometimes you got to cut your losses and run and go. Oh, well, you know that's not going to work. No mistakes. Happy accident. Yeah. No, sometimes there are mistakes that are tragic. <laughs> tragic mistakes. But hopefully you can salvage it. But the joy of experimentation with the without the fear of, of destruction. And also now we're really pushing, or at least in the classes that I've taught with Photoshop, really pushing non destructive editing because there is a point at which you do push your computer, computer. There is a point at which if you've destroyed the original image by doing things directly to it, resizing it and stuff like that, you're going to lose data and you can't get that data back unless you go back to the original image. Now we try to use non-destructive editing, which opens up even more options and more decisions for you to be able to juggle around to, find, to figure out what you want to do. All right. I'm spending a little too much time on the nose. Nina, are you just echo when you talk? I don't echo. Are you getting an echo? No, no. I was asking because I took my phone off of mute, and I wanted to make sure that since it's on speaker, you're not hearing yourself. No, I'm, I'm on my headset. 
so I'm not. I would let you know. I would let you know if I was echoing because when I hear myself delayed, I, I slip into. A, yeah. Yeah, I slip into my time space continuum disruption field, and I can't be in two places okay, at once at the I same just time. To make sure I wasn't causing an echo. <laughs> no. I'm making lunch. Okay. No, it's just. Uh, Okay, so Kyra was the one that was asking about the, no, Marsha was asking about the textures, right? She's still in the class? Because I know a couple people left. A couple people left? Yep, a couple that's correct. Okay, a couple oh, people are showing up. So is this helping you <laughs> understand the textures a little bit better? It is. I like being able to watch you going with the lights and the darks. So... Don't do that. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm I, I'm not in an office anymore. I am in the middle of my house at the moment. Um, so I don't have proper recording a proper recording setup. It's pretty raw. My ultimate dream my ultimate dream for these kinds of classes in the future at some point when technology gets good enough is to have it set up in my studio, actually in my studio with a real easel and a real model. And what would be even cooler would be to have everybody that's participating in the drawing also be able to show their screens so that I can go around and look at what everybody's doing. Because in a real classroom, People are working on their their stuff, so, and I can go around and see their stuff from their vantage so point. Pardon? Basically, what you're looking for is a classroom, like a live session classroom that can be entered from anywhere in the world. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And it would be even cool. cooler. It would be even cooler if you could choose where you were sitting, even if it's a. a, a um, virtual sitting so you can have a different view of the model the model would be photo would be cameraed from all sides and you can choose your position and then i could see what you're drawing from your position and help where there's confusion or just inability to comp you know to decipher what's going on because that's what i do when i'm in a real class so it would be like an actual or, uh, Stop it. It would be a real classroom, but done on the computer. Well, only because, and the only reason why I would do that is because I want to um, allow anyone to be able to show up. But I think it's awfully darn important for uh, to do stuff from life. It really is. There really is no substitute for, for that. There are band-aids and things that you can do. But if you learn to only draw from photographs, your work is going to be flat and lifeless. I, I can almost guarantee it. If you don't work sometimes from life and bring that sensibility of working from the direct interpretation of your eyes on a 3D space, there's more than one way to see in 3D and more than one way to see depth. One is binocular vision. We Most of us have binocular vision. Some people don't, and that's okay. The camera does not have binocular vision. The camera is monocular. With binocular vision, we our brain automatically takes the two images. That's why, you know, the stereoscopes, you guys all know about stereoscopes, right? The images are taken from mm -hmm. slightly different positions so that it, it imitates that sense of, uh, of being in a looking at something with binocular vision. So you see depth that way. But that's not the only way. That's just the, the first way. It's other things you use to see and identify depth is um, contrast, acuity, value. Things get lighter and if there's color involved, they get actually bluer as they move off into the distance. That's atmospheric perspective. Size, scale, overlap. 
Oh, what? Shadows. I yep. like playing with shadows when I'm painting mm-hmm. because I use um, like a dark blue and mix it with like just a tiny bit of white. Yep. And it kind of gives this off blue color. Yep. And I use those for the, or I use that color for the shadow in my mountains. And it was kind of funny when I was uh, painting, my cousin was watching me and I was mixing up the shadows and he's like, what color are you going to use that for? Is that for the sky? I was like, the sky's already painted. He's like, I know. That's why I can't figure out what that color is. Like, it's the shadow on the mountain. He's that's like, the, but, yeah, that's the, black? <laughs> no, no, no. And it's not black. See that, that is very true. And what you're seeing in the reflected light is you're going to see, and you're dealing with light and translating it into, if you're translating it into paint, of course. But the reason shadows tend to be blue and cool, which is a given, and highlights tend to be warm and yellowish, is because we have evolved on a planet that has a yellow sun and the sky reflects the colors of the, I think it's something to do with the colors of space I don't know or the lack of color but at any rate our atmosphere has blue in it so most shadows will have blue because of the reflection of the sky and the highlights will be warm because of the effect of the yellow sun so that being said most shadows if you want to make them look like shadows you make you drop them in the cool cool them down with blue or black. Black is really just a lot of blue. Dark, 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 blue. Although you can get a black, a greenish black, a reddish black. There's warm blacks, there's cool blacks. When you start dealing with paint, it can get really nuts. And you can change the temperature in your Photoshop pieces too. But uh, that's, you know, if you don't understand what you're doing, then that can be more difficult. If I'm rambling, it's because I'm talking without, while I'm drawing, and my right brain and my left brain are disconnected right now. So it's difficult to self-monitor. I really like these dog's eyes, or this husky's eyes. What I'd like to do, what I think I will do, which I've done in the past. And yes, Joe, I still have your drawing that I promised you, and it's still sitting in my studio waiting to be shipped. <laughs> is go I in. Know. I know, it's terrible. It's to go in there. With, I, it's not a procrastination. Yep, and it's sitting right next to it. The two of them are sitting right next to each other. There's another one that I need to ship somewhere. <sighs> It'll happen. It'll happen. I already made a place on the wall for it. <laughs> I will ship it in its frame. I was going to take it out of the frame and roll it up. I'm going to ship it in its frame because I've got, I think I've got something that that will work. So I'm not really trying. Okay. I'm not really trying to draw every single hair, but I do want the strokes of my pencil to imitate the direction of the fur because it'll make it more realistic. But I'm not. I'm not looking for individual hairs to show up except right on the transitions and in this case the transitions are between the two different colors of fur and then and on top of that the two different the light between the light and the dark all right oh nina oh yeah we're gonna be having a new person in one of these live sessions. Okay. And she's my best friend. She doesn't talk a lot, but she likes to draw. That's fine. And I told her she was invited, so I don't know when she'll be here, but eventually she'll show up. That's okay. You can yeah, I act, it. feel feel free to share the link with everybody. The more, you know, the more minions I get, the the uh, <laughs> the stronger my army becomes. An army of realist artists. Or something like that. I don't know. Yeah. That'd be cool. They have to stick together. It's nice to have a little bit of a following. I'm on Twitter too. I actually have a Twitter account. I don't use and it very often. I but put the Twitter on the realm. You want so to put we the also tw- have a donation page. Yeah. If you want to help me out, help me buy pencils. <laughs> um, did, you, did you say? Let me explain. 
do you do you have the Twitter thing on that page or do I need to give it to you? I need to get the Twitter plugged into the realm. Okay. And as far as the donation page, that was my idea. Yep. And the reason for that is because it is really expensive and everybody that comes to these live sessions, I'm assuming, is um, understands how the economy is right now. Yeah. Understands that $170 for a website is really expensive in today's economy. Yeah. So even maybe if even just helps, yeah, that's, like, that's a, a dollar. That's a very good idea. It's really it's not really about making money, but it's about maintaining the website because you, we can if we have an income on the donation, we can upgrade it, right, and make it more robust. So that yeah. would be important. Yeah. Yeah. Everything on there would improve. We would have more space. We would be able to host more videos. Uh, we would get our own URL so we wouldn't be that Nina Stanley at Wix.com. It would actually have its own personalized URL. And uh, that would be good for a year. And we could get some of the features that people have been requesting, like the Skype and stuff. We would actually be able to get those features because those are paid features. And there's also and copy, copyright issues. I'm sure if we want to really hook into some of these modeling sites too, I mean, they require licensing fees. I mean, sure that they should, if they don't, they should. Um, so that we would be able to have a wider range of resources if we were able to, uh, to pay for, you know, the right to use something without fear of being, on, uh, you know what I'm talking about? Copyright the infringement. Copyright laws. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Yep the copyright infringement. So that could eventually feed into that idea of using things that are, that cost royalties to use. So, yeah. So the donation button is really for the maintenance of the website at this point. And, and that's why it says, even if you look on it, it says that there's $170 to get us up off the ground. Anything over that will be used to maintain it further. It's all for maintenance. None of that is going towards me. None of that is going towards Nina. It is just specifically for the website and improving what we have on there. Yeah. Yeah, because otherwise the school would be all over my case, wouldn't they? So... I have to be careful mm -hmm. about that. Yeah. And that's why I said Nina wasn't involved in setting that up. That was me and my idea because I didn't – because the school won't fund something like that. So right. either Nina would have to pay for it out of pocket or I could have, like I did, set up a donation thing for all of us to chip in to do it together. That's pretty cool, actually. It's a good thing. And, you know, it only takes yeah. like a few pennies from each person that comes and kind of spreads out the pain a little bit. So now I've tried to use the gray of the paper to pull in some of the shadow. I've tried to. I'm not sure that I'm happy with it. Put a little dark here. Looks good here. What's really cool is the specular highlights on eyes. And I would imagine if this this photo has already been run through some filters I can make it probably even a little bit more realistic by putting what I know would be a little bit of reflected light on the bottom of the eyes here and then we've got a little sharp nose and then he's got these whiskers that are going across his face here which I'm not sure I like but I tried it. Okay. Any piece I do for a demo is for sale or trade. Um, I have, they are accumulating at an alarming rate and I don't know what to do with them all. So there you go. I, I have an address you can send this one to. Oh, really? <laughs> I, will give you the I will give you the address. You can stick it in an envelope. You can even, like, cut half the picture off and just send one half or whatever. It's a few. 
but I have an address you can send this one to. All righty. Who's the My happy friend will love it. It's the happy recipient? Well, I owe you some for doing all the websites, so you can pick and choose a few of these guys. But like the dove that I have on one, well, right one of the sites. Oh, that's a beautiful dove. I sold it to one of my former students that from on ground. He saw it on Facebook and he liked it. I said, make an offer. Cool. So pretty much make an offer because I'm going to do these regardless. And um, they're, they're just, you know, I can't throw them. I don't want to throw them out. And if I give too much of my art away, then it just... You know, it's not good for it's not good for you to Rocky give your art said. away. Hmm. So Rafi would probably be mad at you. Oh, he would kill me. Totally. I mean, I've already gotten in serious trouble for giving some what I thought were pretty useless little prints and drawings and things away. So you devalue your work if you just give it away. That's one of the reasons I don't really dig those uh, silent auctions and things either. Here's the thing about the silent auction. If you're asked to donate a piece of work to a silent auction for a charity and you're the artist, you can only deduct from your taxes the cost of the materials you use to make the art. If you're the artist. If you sell the piece to somebody... I know. But if you sell the piece to somebody for a certain amount of money and they donate it, they can deduct the entire um, value of the art that they bought and donated from their taxes. So there you go. Welcome to the real world. Here's another thing. I mean, I, that's just wrong. Well, it just is the way it is because you could set your own value. You could say, oh, well, this is going to cost a million dollars, but you're, it's only worth what someone will pay for it. So if somebody actually comes up to it and pays for it, then then it's worth that, right? You sold it for that. Right. In some places, in California, for instance, if you, um, if you sell art, a piece of art, say I sold a painting to somebody for $2,000, and 10 years later they turn around and sell it for $2 million, theoretically I should get a percentage of the appreciation of that painting which is a good reason to keep track of your work and where it's going. Percentage and of the profit. Yep. And But that's not in every state. Yeah. I think that's Probably. only in California and New York. Probably. They're, they're the most progressive. I might have. All right. And I'm not sure if it's New York State or New York City. Okay, I'm going to do this one now because I like that's it. you got to have profit. That's why you got to have what? You need to send a letter of authenticity with all of your work and say that um, I, the artist, Nina Stanley, am sending it to whatever the person's name is and authorize that this is a true and legitimate copy or put that on your paintings on the back of them or your drawings on the back. Well, if I Because the letter of authenticity... You're right. You're absolutely right. And there's more to it than that. You should also always maintain the complete reproduction rights. If you're selling a piece of work to somebody and they're going to reproduce it, then they have to buy, they have to pay extra for that. I have to sharpen some pencils, so I'm going to uh, mute my mic for a second. Uh-oh. I'm about to try to switch to my uh, tablet because my phone is dying. Uh -oh. Good luck. I just dropped my kneaded eraser into a hair in a rat or a dust bunny nest. Oh, fine. Those are not easy to shave. <laughs> no. <laughs> <clears throat> You have dust bunnies and not dust rhinos, huh? Well, just under the desk. Everywhere else, they're rhinos. <laughs> my, I stay with my grandpa to help take care of him because he's 89. 
But my grandmother passed away a couple of years ago, and he still isn't ready to get rid of all of her stuff. Uh huh. But we're not allowed to move anything. Hmm. So there's dust everywhere. He doesn't have a lot of animals. Like I have a plethora. Of, my my dust bunny situation is pretty pretty intense because I uh, I have six cats the in the house. The two dogs that we have are my dogs, and they stay in the laundry room. <laughs> I don't know. Can you hear my daughter singing? They're not allowed to have the laundry room unless they're... We cannot. We're losing people. People are coming in and out. I don't know if they're doing it on purpose or by accident. But uh, it's okay. It's by accident because my... It's, it's me. I'm just trying to get a better... Because uh, my battery is dying. Oh, right. Okay. Okay. So, now I'm going to do this guy here. This wolf. Because I like it. And I can trim between the two. This one has some red in it, which is really cool, and I'll have to add that later because my red pencils are in the studio. But you can get pencils that are kind of like this that are red. Sanguine, actually. It's not red. That's like a colored pencil. I'm not looking for a colored pencil. I'm looking for it. Like what you used on the black paper. That, that, that kind of a burnt sienna sanguine color. Conti. Right. Yeah, it's Conti. I could use Conti. But um, these come in pencil forms. And I prefer the pencil form because I like the control of the point. Um, for most things, there's always exceptions where you want to have something where you can use the side and the edge. Like I could go back in. This isn't really black, black, black. But I could go in with compressed charcoal, which I probably will do, and blacken that in solid and maybe even stub it. If you use uh, um, a stub, a stump like this, because the texture really does disappear in that dark area, if I darken it, it'll make the texture part of it more pronounced, which will make it a little bit, yeah, I'm going to do that. I don't have any compressed charcoal out here right now, but I will do that before, okay. and I'll send, I'll post a picture of it. Okay, let's see if I can get this guy in here. So how long did that take me? Did anybody time me? Was that about an hour for that dog? Or the husky? Um, try like an hour and a half. Okay. So that that's a, it's a good idea to keep track of how long it does take you to do, do work because when you do get round to pricing it, you want to know that you're at least not I'm working for pennies on the hour. It's hard though. You know, there was. Um, you guys are familiar with Whistler. A little art history here. I don't know how much art history people can actually get these days. Um, Whistler, since it's too big, I make it smaller. Did some paintings that he called Nocturnes. I think there were Nocturnes in blue, or different colors, and they didn't take him very long to do. But he sold them for the same basic price that he sold. So his other work, well, the guy that that commissioned them sued him, saying these only took you, you know, a fraction of the time to to create. Why are you charging me as much as you charged, you know, for the ones that took you months? And he said, you're paying for my years and years of experience and skill. It's not just the the time that I put into one individual piece but the time that I've right. put into developing my skill over the years. So as you guys get better, remember that it's not just about the time, although it's good to know how long it takes you to do stuff because sometimes you do have to bid a job or something that you're doing for somebody by the hour. But in your own work, don't be afraid to ask what it's worth. And of course, if you spend a hundred, I had, had this, oh man, I had this argument with this guy in Norway when I was doing the Norwegian thing. Um, this guy went on and on and on about the hundreds and thousands of hours that he had invested in this drawing. And so I said, well, what if, if you, you know, what if someone did a drawing that was just as good as yours, but only spent 10 hours? Should they charge less for their work? 
I mean, just because you spent thousands of hours on it, it doesn't by its in and of itself make it more valuable. You know, it, it right. could still be a crappy drawing. <laughs> you know, sometimes that happens. You can spend hours and hours and hours on something that's still crap. You know, you can polish a turd and polish a turd and polish a turd. In the end, you just have a very shiny a turd. turd. Yeah. We used to say that in the game industry all the time is they we would have a game that had been worked on for months and months and months and all this money put into it and it was still crap. And it was never going to be anything other than crap unless you took it all apart and started over again from the ground up. But we would have to keep trying to make it, you know, viable. And so we'd be, you'd be at the point where you'd be polishing it and polishing and polishing it, but it was never going to actually be worth what it would have been. There was some flaw in the design or something. They don't always work. It's like music too. Sometimes it's a hit and sometimes it's not. And you don't know what your the public's well, going to like. Pardon? I was just going to say there's that game that um, they've been working on since I got into AIU and or whatever it's called, AIO. Anyway, oh, yeah. they have a game that they were doing and they released some videos for it and I posted on there and I'm like, you know, maybe this is just really harsh critique but you guys really need to hear this and not be patted on the head and told that this was a good job and actually give, you know, honest feedback. Right. So this video is crap. This game that you guys have spent all these hours on is retarded. It's crap. <laughs> the co the but color you... schemes are all wrong. You got your shadows in the wrong spots. So that makes it really impossible to see any detail up close. Mm. Your lighting effects are substandard. Literally, like they have the lighting on the wrong side. Right. No, and it's true. And yeah, you're in, I when you're like, in, I am so, so what was the reaction when you gave them your honest feedback? Were they offended? Um. Yeah, they kind of were. They were like, well, this is just students and blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, yeah, that's why I'm saying it. The, yeah. They need you, to know now whether or not to do that or not. This that's very is where true. it's okay to make mistakes. This isn't where you get patted on the head and told good job. We're not in first grade here. This is where you need <laughs> to hear the feedback, make the mistakes, so you know what you did wrong so you can correct it next time right. and get you know good paying jobs. If they turn this into their employer thinking that it was great because you idiots told them that it was great just because they were students, their employer is going to fire them because they're idiots. And that wouldn't be their fault. That would be your fault for not telling them to begin with that they had the lighting reversed. Well, it's hard. It's hard to give critique to people. And, and even in, in the business, when you're in, in the industry and you have a team of artists and they're all working their butts off and they think they're doing something really off, really amazing. And it's not, it's not going to work. You have to be able to tell them, sorry, you're going to do this over. But if you're a good art director, you will tell them why and give them some ideas. If you're a bad art director, you'll just say, that sucks, do it over. And there's both, <laughs> yeah. both, kinds. There's both yeah. kinds out there. So if you are aiming to be an art director in, an, in a company of any kind, be sure that you know enough about what your your uh, team has to do so that you can offer reasonably intelligent and useful suggestions. I always, always made a point of that. Yeah, when I, was I did. I, so that's good. If you I just tell them this crap and not tell them why, then that's no good. Yeah. No, it sounds like you did the right thing. Yeah, no, I, like, what exactly it was they did wrong? Mm -hmm. And from a visual perspective, and I said on there, I am not an expert, but from a visual perspective, this is what is wrong with it. This is what needs to be fixed. Your, and one of the things that irritated me the most was that they have this beautiful castle made, or at least I assume it was supposed to be beautiful, or it would have been beautiful, but they have the textures on the wrong side of the object. Oh, and I'm like, no. really? That's, that's, out, that's, that's, that's something just like it, that is like a one of those are you, seriously <laughs> you, know, you can't see this turn it around and fix it you know look at your own 
you gotta be to knock at your texas right um it's not the map it correctly well it's a i don't know how it is in 3d now but there's a there's something called normals and they're the the way the Polygon is drawn usually cl counterclock in my experience, and I'm, I'm old original technology. The polygon is drawn counterclockwise, then the face faces towards the viewer, towards the the Z is it Z Z is depth it, towards you. If you draw it clockwise, then the normals are reversed and facing away, and the basically the polygon would become transparent because it doesn't have a face. Some you can put normals on both sides. Yeah. They're doubled up polygons, I guess, or maybe they make polygons now that have normals on both sides. But if you're not aware of which direction your normals are facing, you can really uh, make a mess of your texturing. It's true. And one of the things that I used to do, because I worked on N64, which I really liked, and I worked on the, um, the Game Boy and the uh, Advan Game Boy Advanced. <laughs> Um, you're limited. You have a limited amount Did of space. You work for game? I love Pardon? Did you work for Game Freak by any chance? No. I worked for Vicarious Visions, First Playable, Electronic Arts, Capcom. Um, oh my god, I uh, love Capcom. They do Castlevania. They are cool. Yeah, but they do that in Japan. Unfortunately, Capcom... Yeah. Sorry, Capcom USA doesn't really do didn't really do much in the way of development. It didn't work out. So most of their development is done in Japan. So I worked for a, a, It was a rather short lived Oh I made one. Yeah, you made one. Well we're sitting here doing textures. I'm doing textures. So oh. Okay. Uh, I'm recording <laughs> I'm recording it too, so um I, I will try to upload it. It'll probably be enlisted, and, and I might the not. The idea it. is to get it on the site eventually. Yeah. I'll probably upload it to YouTube and unlist it, it and just send out a link. Because I don't edit. I'm lousy at editing. Oh, this, this one has a blue eye. So I might do to this dog or this husky or this wolf or whatever the heck it is. What I've done in the past where I take gouache and paint like just a little bit of color, just a little bit of really intense color over in one area for a highlight, for a spot. For Notice that the dog's eyes are facing forward. A dog, a wolf, canines are predators. It's actually slightly curved. You can see across his nose and then his other eye would be over here. So. It's slightly turned, but the eye is not like like this, right? The eye is like like this from the side. It's really important when you're drawing animals and humans that you get the eyes on the right plane of the face. So you would best. use gouache over using like a Prismacolor pencil? Um, yeah, I would because I'm, Prismacolor just takes too long. It's, it's tedious. And um, although I don't know, I just bought some new paper that's supposed to be specifically for Prismacolors, and I do like to use the watercolor Prismacolor pencils or the Cron de Gouache because you can draw them like water like pencils and then use water to paint. But on this gray paper, the water watercolors are transparent and will not um, – I'm sorry. Um, they're transparent and they won't cover. The gouache is opaque. They're both water-based paints. Um, gouache will cover the gray, whereas the watercolor won't – you have to do watercolor on white paper. Because it doesn't, and that, that makes it even more challenging because you have to preserve your whites. You can't replace your whites unless you paint with something other than watercolor, which would then, of course, change the very nature of your of your paint. Because one of the things about watercolor that makes it so difficult is its transparent nature. 
and so it's an exception. When I paint with watercolors, I do paint on white. When I paint with oils, I paint on a toned ground. When I draw, I prefer to draw on a toned ground if I'm using charcoal, like I am now. Um, for color, it would probably... I don't use prism colors enough to really make that dis dis that hard and fast, but it could be done. I uh, made his forehead too short. I'm not happy with that. So here's how I check my proportions when I'm drawing from life or from photographs is I'll flip my eyes back and forth between the two really, really fast. And if you do that really fast, you'll start to see where the proportions or the, the shapes, the flat 2D shapes are, are off a little bit. So I'm going to try to fix yeah, that. Right behind the ear. Pardon? Well, they haven't done the back of the ear here. This needs to go back here. Here, what I'm looking at is here. Yeah. This forehead area here. Okay. Um, you just, you know, I could also superimpose it since it's part, partly digital, but I don't want to do that. This is what I would do if I was working from. I try to work on digitally like I do from life. So, and like I was saying, if you use digital a no, lot. My screen is still froze on e work now. It's what? Come on. Oh, you oh, my, my, my screen is still frozen with you uh, circling the eye. For some reason. Oh really? Huh. That's okay. I've had to start my window a few times just to make sure I my thing keeps going. Yeah. That's unfortunate. Oh, I there wonder, we go. Now we're moving. I wonder if that's a a uh, artifact of the GoToMeeting software or just the internet in general. I was gonna say I am in Alaska, so I was kind of leaning towards the <laughs> internet, but. If it's some other people, yeah, I'd probably say it might be the uh, might be the application. Yeah, I I haven't found the perfect so application. You're from Boston. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sure up here in Anchorage. Here. That's pretty cool. Oh God, that's even worse. Why? We'll just have Kate build a new application. My cousin lives in Alaska. <laughs> Remember that conversation we had? while ago about the guy that doesn't know how to take care of yeah remember, remember that would be I'm my recording this was I just had to turn off my camera because oh, oh crap I think I just lost my all my uh, recording from no. my camera that's too bad I had to turn off the camera because it froze up so which means that I don't think it recorded but yeah we we're recording that's why I didn't go into detail but we had a conversation previously when we were uh, doing a male model, and we had talked about guys. Mm -hmm. And the cousin that I was referring to at that point lives in Alaska and says that he doesn't know that stuff because nobody in Alaska knows that stuff. Oh, geez, come on. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, so just... my theory is just avoid Alaska altogether, and everything that he said about Alaska was just like, seriously? Of course, this is the same 23-year-old who I asked him who the founding fathers were. Oh, no. He said, uh, George, Washington, George Washington, Benjamin Franklin, and Michael Jackson. Oh, jeez. <laughs> so much for well, go. American public education, huh? That's... Yeah. He was homeschooled. That's pretty sad. Oh, he was uh, I, had a, I have kids come into my work, and they don't even know what an encyclopedia is. The kid well, told me I had no idea what I was talking about because it's a website. Encyclopedia? Huh. Yeah. I was talking about back when I was in high school, you know, when we had to do reports, you have to look in the encyclopedia, or you right. have to go through a catalog system, and you know, have to know the Dewey Decimal System. Right. And he was right. like, well, obviously you don't know how to use the internet because it's a website, <laughs> not a book. <laughs> yeah. Encyclopedia, not Wikipedia. Exactly. There's a reason it's called Wikipedia. It's based on an encyclopedia, but it's yeah. Anyway. Mm -hmm. Oh well. It's publicly you know. editable. Yeah. I would. I have a lot of teachers that I've had in the past that are like, yeah, you're not allowed to use anything off of Wikipedia because it's publicly editable. Right. It's exactly. not. Peer, it's not peer reviewed, but they do have a pretty good system of of keeping an eye on stuff and taking down stuff that isn't true. But you never know when you first. Yeah. Yep. Get on there if what you've seen yep. is true. Yep. So, 
But it's the same thing as yeah. so Professor uh, Stanley. Yes. Uh, at this point right now, I, I've got. I'm unfortunately my kids are sick, so I've only got a few minutes before they get here. With adjusting the the length of the forehead between the eyes and the ears, now that you're this far into it, how would you um, adjust that length? You mean this space here? Uh, yes. Um, if it doesn't look bad, I might just leave it. Otherwise, since this is done in white, because I always do my under drawings in white, it's easy to work mm -hmm. over, work over the white. So okay. I could, if I haven't gone too far and I haven't destroyed the surface oh my of God. my paper, I can easily move this back a little bit. This one here, this mm. here. And that's not a problem. If I was using Photoshop, I would just cut it and move it. <laughs> Which another reason is working digitally isn't all that fantastic, except it can be kind of cool for those kinds of things. But yeah, it's like target practice. It's it's better to learn to hit the target. And if you're missing the target, then you need to adjust your aim a little bit until you hit the target. So like if, for instance, if you draw your hands and feet too small, try drawing them a little too big. If you tend to put your okay. eyes too up high on the head, try putting them a little bit too far down. And you probably will find that your your aim improves. You know? Okay, okay so I made it bigger. Is that better? Yep. You happy now? <laughs> <laughs> I was just I was just curious because that's that's always something I end up doing is you know I'll my measurements will look good and then I'll do exactly like you said go quickly between your original and what you're working on and that's when you start to notice the difference and usually yeah. I'm unfortunately I'm such a perfectionist that even with you know as you notice with my gesture drawings I'm you know trying to put in too much detail which is a little right. unnecessary but it's in my mind I feel like I'm not completing it to the fullest, so I was well, just curious. Well, with, with the gesture drawing, you're really trying to capture the movement, and that requires a lot of target practice, and you expect you're going to have to keep yeah. shooting, 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 draw, draw it again, draw it again, draw it again. It's like playing scales. It's like playing a, a really complicated piece on the piano or on the violin. If you get to a point where you're yeah. always sticking it, you got to work at that point. What is it you're always doing that – What like I always put the head in the wrong place still. I've kind of come to the conclusion yeah. that I'm always going to put the head in the wrong place, so I just put it in very, very lightly because I know I'm going to have to move it. <laughs> but the head yeah. is where I always start my gesture drawings, and it usually just ends up being a little yeah. bit nice. So, okay. Yeah, see, that was my problem too. Which doing this, uh, the muscles and the bones have really helped with getting the balance and the flow of the gesture drawing because I was doing the same thing. I was, you know, the head would be cocked off a little bit to the side, and it would totally throw the weight of the entire gesture off. So. Yeah, the weight is very important. If you don't get anything else, you get the the action, the line of energy, where things are going, and then the balance of the figure, because the, the, bal the balance will always, if the figure is standing, if they're not actually flying through the air or something, there's going to be a point yeah. center of gravity, yeah. But... That's okay. okay. You can keep trying doing this is this is probably taking longer than I would see I'm I would go now I would probably go to the stick instead of because this is all solid. There's really no texture right here in the image because it's pretty much washed out. So I could sit here and just layer it until it's solid, or I could go and take some uh, compressed charcoal white compressed charcoal sticks and fill them in and use the chamois or use the, the tortillon or the stump to smooth things out. Not totally required, but it's a, it's a style. Sometimes I don't believe in doing that, actually going in and rubbing things smooth. I think it should be done with the... Uh, with the stroke, but that's graphite usually. I don't like the look of the rubbed graphite, but I like the look of the rubbed charcoal. So, but what I'm trying to do here also is let the gray of the paper do some of the work for me, the midtone. 
so it doesn't have to be covered solid, which I think is uh, something that a lot of students end up trying to do is cover it over solid. You, you don't need to. On the colored paper, let the colored paper be your midtone. Let it work for you. Okay. If you're working on black paper or white paper, then of course, you know, that's the extreme. So. Ah, uh, here, children. Little darlings. Oh yeah, sorry there. No, that's fine. Yeah, they just they just got home. They're in the background, so it's not too bad. Okay. If they start to cause me pain, I will let you know. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And you said you'd be posting this online uh, later on, correct? Yeah, it's an awfully long video, so I don't know. It's been like two hours now. I started at 5-something, and now it's now 7, so I don't know if it's worth putting the whole thing up, but I'm not into editing it, so oh, geez. you guys can always scrub through it. Well, I did this drawing earlier, so I've already got one complete drawing. I might, I might cut it in half based on... What time are you at right now? 7 in the evening. I'm on the East Coast. 7 in the evening? Yeah, I'm only at 3.05 here. Yeah, so you're four hours behind. You're behind even California. That's pretty intense, dude. Yeah, I'm four o'clock here in California. Yeah, well, and we just did our new um, Alaska isn't observing the daylight saving time zone thing anymore. Is from what I've been. Yeah, the daylight saving. So I think it's at the end of 2016 we won't be doing the adjusting anymore because Alaska has its own time zone, unfortunately. Yeah, I don't think it's necessary. Phoenix, uh, Arizona yeah, doesn't do it either. Thing. There's a couple of states that don't recognize the time change, which is, it is kind of silly in my opinion. I don't like yeah. getting up in oh, the It dark. makes it extremely interesting on making sure your assignments get in on time. Oh, yeah, I bet. Yeah, Fort well, especially because I usually have to go in and pull double shifts at my work and those kind of things, so trying to, you know, I get off at 6 o'clock and it's already 10 o'clock there. I'm kind of, you know, running pretty thin. Yeah. yeah. Well, I don't, I'm not too uptight yeah. about that, but I know some teachers are pretty uptight about it. Yeah. And remember, it's based on yeah, my last class was time. It's yes, mountain time. Yeah, it's on mountain time, which is two hours sooner. It's, it's well, it's in between you and me, basically. Although when posting yeah, my grades, yeah. I have to mm -hmm. post them by Eastern Standard Time, and not by. Really? Uh, yeah. So that's why. Okay, I was wondering about that because I know a couple of my comments I posted probably after that time, which was after you'd graded. Yeah, but that's okay. I'll go back and fix it. And if I don't, send me an email. Let me know because I'm not okay. the world's most perfect, like tracker of things like that. The last week is always really... I was going to say, if you were, I would like to know how you did it. I don't. <laughs> I don't. I would <laughs> rather I would rather give good feedback and um, an interesting experience than worry about... In fact, you know, everybody, anybody who's been in my classes for any length of time knows how much I hate grading, which is why it always gets done mm. at the last minute, because I hate it. And I, I, I always want people to redo their stuff. Which which perfect. Is why... Yeah. Well, that's... Yeah, I, I'm really glad you're back. Because I don't like turning in stuff on time because I work between two different computers. I go between my grandpa's desktop and my laptop. And just because there's more room for me to draw at the desk. And it's a bitch to go back and forth for every single assignment. And if I screwed something up, I have time to go back and fix it. And it's easier for me just to submit everything. Everything at the end, so I only have to do it once. Well, yep. not a lot of teachers are going to yeah. be really keen about that. And I do like to see the interims. You know, I like to see how it's going. Because if you just turn in everything right. at the very I, end, there's I need no to get a little bit better with that too. no place for me to make suggestions for corrections yeah. to make it better, and there's no time left to redo it. So it it is important to yeah. post something so that yeah, I, which is why I'm going to. Yeah, posting like, some more stuff today. That's good. So I can at least, I can at least see what you're doing, what you're up to. Yeah, I have right. a hard time when I'm at work. This is my worst day in the world. Yeah, I woke up this morning with both kids being sick, so I had to get them from daycare early, and then had to go back into work. And 
wife just got done picking him up, and now I think I'm going to have to take him to the doctors if they don't get better here in the next 20 minutes. Are they uh, oh, just a basic right? cold or something? Uh, no, it's it's a little bit of vomiting and diarrhea. Oh, about this, wow. about two o'clock this morning, it started going in that direction, and now you know I'm all vitamin C, airborne, and you know basically every <laughs> echinacea you can take right now, trying to stay away from it. So I got my flu shot. I I, I went ahead and got my flu shot <laughs> this year. Yeah, that's a that's a I touchy one with me. Shot. And I'm the only one not sick at my work, so I think my decision was right. <laughs> yep. It's pra practically, it's usually free if you have any kind of insurance. And it's, even if it's not free, it's not very much. And it's certainly oh, worth. My work gives it for free. Oh, yeah. Great. But it's I, cer I'm an asthmatic, worth... so uh, I think medications yeah. make it so I can get things easy, so I don't take any of the live vaccines. Yeah, I don't think they do the live vaccines anymore. They didn't for where I went. It wasn't a live vaccine. Oh, my God. Can you hear my yeah, daughter? Yeah, I don't think the FDA does those. Yes, you can. Very slightly. <laughs> What's really funny is she gets her headphones on, and she'll start singing at the top of her voice, and she can't really hear herself very well. So, oh, my goodness. When she sings beautifully, yeah. it's just it's a talent to be able to sing with headphones on. You have to be able to hear yourself as well as... Wow. Yeah, I rather like this, and I rather like the way it's faded off. I think that I'm not going to overwork this one too much because I rather. So it like, looks really good. I rather like this. It looks like yep. a good. Yeah. I think once you do that eye, it'll all just pop. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> All right. Well, it sounds like my youngest is having a meltdown, so unfortunately, I'm going to have to leave you guys here. All right. Well, we'll be All back. Right, on, we'll be back. All on right, Friday. Joe. You have. Good luck. Hope they're okay. Sign up for All the right. website. Well, hopefully, I'll be able to make it. Sign up for the website. Did you get Sign the link? Sign up for the. Oh, is that what that? Yeah. Get that link. Sign up for I the website. I did just get this. Okay. All right. Well, I'll do that. Cool. It's good. Well, glad you could make it in, even if it was only for a few minutes. Yes, thank you. Sure. All right. I, I rather like this. Now, I I could go in and really black out the black background with a compressed charcoal. I'm not sure I'm going to do that. You see, because once I do that, that's, that's a decision I can't undo. That's one of those things where you mm -hmm. have to be able to make that decision and then stick with it. I wouldn't. I think it looks good the way it is. Yep. Just a little bit of dark. Leave the less rest gray. Yeah, but I'm going to have to send you pictures of mine because the eye came out amazing on the eye. But um, compared to the rest of it, it just, the eye is awesome. It just doesn't fit with the drawing. Oh, really? It's almost vertical. Oh, well. I really screwed up on that. Happens. It happens. All right. Well, I think I should probably end this, and I should probably check my classes because I haven't checked them all day. But I really do enjoy drawing for you guys, and I love it when there's people here. And I even like it when people pop in and out. I think it's uh, it's rather charming. I am going to get a little bit of red to put in here, and I'm going to put a little bit of blue here. And I might even put a little bit of red right here, just because it's interesting. Just just the sanguine, though. I'm going to use the sanguine pencils. I'm going to go out in the studio and get those things. So when you see the final oh, version, hmm? I know it looks like red, but I want to use sanguine. That's an artistic choice. And uh, we can do that. Once we know the rules, remember, we can break the rules as much as we like. As long as you're breaking them because you know you're breaking them and not because you don't know any better. Right. All right. You guys have any other questions or anything? <laughs> I hope um, I do. No, I managed to sign up for the newsletter and um, those kind of things. I, I do have to take my kids to the doctors, it looks like. Um, hopefully I'll have my comments in 
before tonight. Well, good luck with that. Good luck. With